The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Durgenti, the Director of Design and Engineering for Burr Process Equipment. I want to welcome you today to Burr Processes Equipment's educational webinar on RODI High Purity Water Systems. With me today is Madison Mulkley, one of our fellow design engineers who will be assisting me uh, during the broadcast. Uh, we'll, we'll keep this kind of casual today as we go along. As you can see, there's a chat window. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to punch those in, and we'll try to answer all questions during the broadcast. Any questions we do not get to, we'll answer uh, at the end or via email. Um, there will also be a number of poll questions asked throughout. They're entirely voluntary uh, for people just to kind of gauge you know, what they're learning as we go through this. And again, this is educational, um, so obviously, and we're always interested in feedback. There'll be a email sent out after this broadcast for any feedback you have or future webinar topics you'd like to see addressed. RODI systems and high purity water systems in general, obviously is a very broad category. Um, it covers everything from, you know, very simple kind of softening water systems, you know, to RO systems, which are used in like humidification applications, to ASDM and cap grade systems that are utilized in colleges, lab, you know, laboratories, all the way up to, you know, USP water for, you know, for the pharmaceutical to ASDM E grade water, you know, for something not your applications. So really today, what we're going to primarily focus on is kind of touching on all of those to some degree, but really talking about kind of the core, really how you design and look at, you know, if you have an RDI project that you're working on design or in your own building, you have one coming up and you're trying to look at, you know, kind of what are the things you need to look for with that type of system. That's what we're going to really address today. And you can see here a couple of pictures of a few systems varying, obviously, in complexity. And we're going to kind of kind of delve deep into, you know, some of the lighter aspects of this topic as well as some of the more in-depth aspects of this topic. But first, one of the things I like to always address is water quality. And when you're talking about any high purity water system, you know, whether, you know, high purity, people use the term RO, RODI, and those are kind of, you know, the term RO or RODI is kind of a misnomer. Because obviously RO and DI are two pieces of technology which are both utilized in a high purity water system. And high purity water systems encompass a lot of different design parameters. You can see here the ASTM standards. And this is one of those common standards you utilize, ASTM 1, 2, 3, and 4. There are subgrades of these, A, B, and C, as well as electronics grades of those as well. And these come from a number of different parameters, you know between resistivity, pH, TOC, or total organic carbon, sodium chloride, different mineral content, bacteria, endotoxins. And your RO, your, your RO and your DI components of those work on some of these different parameters, but really an RODI system is, is basically a, a engineered process system that incorporates a number of different technologies together to move you from your source water quality, whether that be city water or well water, to an end product water quality, such as you see here on the screen. And it's really important early on in a project to kind of have both of those. And we're gonna kind of see why we get a little further into the presentation. Those two parameters are really are utilized to basically assemble the overall processes of your high purity water system. CAP is the one I mentioned. CAP is the College of American Pathologists, previously known as NCCLS, um, or Natural Community for Clinical Laboratory Standards. They're really just two competing uh, standards for water quality. And then you get into the more, let's say, say more elaborate types of water quality. And these are like your electronics grades of water quality. It's, it's really kind of showing this here as an example. You can really see here, you know, beyond just resistivity and conductivity, now we're talking about TOC, we're talking about different things like dissolved oxygen, where you're going to have to actually uh, remove gases from your system. We're talking about particle counts. We're going into potentially even submembranes downstream of a reverse, reverse osmosis process. Um, all kinds of different minerals down to the PPB range. Obviously, you know, this is getting into, you know, very, this is also referred to as like ultra pure water at that point. So you're almost taking this to another level above high purity water to really addressing this as an ultra pure water source. But it does still rely on a lot of the same technologies obviously built to a higher level of process understanding and including additional technologies beyond that to allow you to meet these different water quality objectives as well as be able to sustain them in a system. 
one of the things people have to realize about any high purity water system is even if I can initially say it started by the system, make this water, these are, you know, maintenance systems. There's a loop involved. There's some kind of a feed pipe, which we'll talk about a little later. That all needs to be maintained, sanitized, you know, in order to maintain that water quality standard, you know, over the life of the system and its use. So this is kind of the basic breakdown of what's involved in any high purity water system. You have some pretreatment, which include which can be anything from repressurization of the water that you have to have sufficient pressure when you get to your RO, softening, chlorine removal, particulate removal, pH adjustment, tempering, tempering control. Really, your pretreatment system is designed to facilitate an effective R reverse osmosis process. Your RO system does 98% of the work of any high purity water system. Um, and we'll talk about the RO in a second. Really, everything really from your reverse, from your RO back, we refer to you as the pretreatment and generation system. Um, everything downstream of the storage tank, we refer to as a distribution portion. That's where you have recirculation, you have ion exchange, UVs, filters, the lube, EDI, degas, all that kind of stuff really falls into, and that's really what we call the recirculation as well as the polishing side of the system. Now, some of these can be utilized on the pretreatment side of the system as well, um, but by and large, majority of the yeah, you know, these majorities do fall kind of downstream. And as we look at a couple of examples, there's reasons why you move them around in different locations in your system as well. This schematic here shows kind of a standard pretreatment train. Um, you can see here, you know, through a 3D model out, you have your city water, there may be upstream of it a city water booster pump. You know, you have your uh, particulate filtration, water softening, carbon, and then you obviously you have your RO, which then feeds down into your storage tank system. This is the generation rate, and it is different than your distribution rate. So there's kind of two terms that come up when people talk about RODI design, and that is how much water I need and how much water I need to recirculate and or put to my various processes. When you're talking about how much water you're making up, this is really the area of the system that you're talking about. Whether I need 1,000 gallons a day or 10,000 gallons a day, this is where you're ultimately kind of designing that into your system. And is also the most flow dependent part of your system from a sizing perspective. Um, so when you have a pretreatment train um, like this, when you're talking about an RO makeup, which could be one GPM, five GPM, that's really where you're kind of sizing. That's, that's kind of saying, you know, in my process here, in my laboratory space, I'm going to use X amount of volume. That's where you, where you want to generate it. And that's over an eight hour period or 24 hour period in those cases. The loop design and the loop flow rate is going to be probably be substantially higher than this. And that comes into more of a design of the size of your loop, the number of processes. We'll talk about some loop designs a little bit later, as well as maintaining sufficient volume and velocity in your loop as far as treatment is concerned. I mentioned earlier that the RO system is the primary, really does 90, 95% of the work in your system. And that's because when you look back at all those different water qualities, you're talking about resistivity and conductivity, which are going to be a result of various minerals or ionic content found in the water, you know, the TOCs, all that, they're almost referred to as dissolved solids. And dissolved solids, you know, is really any particulate which falls below 0 0.045 micron. And what an RO system does is an RO system is basically a TDS filter. So you're basically pushing water at a specific pressure across a membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. And the process of doing this affects all those future parameters of your water quality system. And this is done obviously at a fairly high pressure because you're moving against the osmotic gradient, which obviously wants water to go to the area of higher solutes in your system. So to over, overcome that, you could be running at, you're running at fairly high pressures, 175 PSI, 250 PSI. There's a whole sizing calculation that goes into that, which I'll show you guys here in a couple of minutes. But that's why the RO system is the most critical, because it's taking out 95% of what you need to to actually get to your target water quality. 
And because of an RO unit operates, you you have to have a reject stream. So as an RO is an operation and you're pumping this water through, um, you have to actually have those solutes go somewhere else. Um, and what happens is that causes what's referred to as the reject stream from your RO. And that's some fraction of the water, which is one recycle back to allow you to basically do some water conservation as well as allow for proper membrane treatment, but is also discharged as part of as basically a waste stream along with your other backwash from your pretreatment. And this in really optimizing that flow, how much you get was referred to as permeate, which is a generated RO water quality. And now what you have is reject water going to drain, you know, is one of the things that's optimized as part of an RO system design. And generally the most optimized ROs will tend to have maybe a 20% reject uh, at best. So if I put five gallons from an into my system, I get four GPM out and I, send, and I send one GPM to the drain. Kind of a good rule of thumb is on an unoptimized RO system, you are looking at about, you know, for every one gallon, you know, for every one gallon of per, you two gallons coming in, they're fifty percent reject. That's obviously not an ideal situation. And the bigger the RO that you have, um, the more that becomes apparent. If you're talking about a small RO, say a couple of GPM, you know, you may be sending, you know, what you put two in, you send one to the drain, and one goes to dish, you know, one goes to your, you know, as this permeates. When you start looking at systems where you're going to have, say, um, you know, 50 GPM permeate, now that optimization becomes critical, saying 10 GPM, 20 or 30 GPM down the drain um, becomes a lot more critical at those points. So, Mark, I have a question for you. Something that comes up often is uh, the option for pretreat of chlorine or chloramine removal in an RODI system, and what are the options for those? Sure. So, one of the byproducts that's found very often in city water is chlorine. Obviously, people they chlorinate the water at, 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 uh, for use in a city water system uh, for purity levels. The issue is when you bring that now city when you bring that city water now in and put it into a high purity water system, those chlorines will actually oxidize your RO membranes over time. So you need to ensure that you reduce those levels down prior to feed into your RO system. One of the ways which is done is through carbon filtration. And in carbon filtration is a media bed, just like, you know, a softener or a multimedia filter, which then targets those chlorines. Chloramines are a little bit different, require a little bit more aggressive form of, of treatment. The issue with, with just having carbon beds is they are one of the sources of bacteria in your system. And really any of those types of resin canisters are over time, your water softeners and your media filters, because they have stagnant they have water passing through them in a the very large surface area. And I would say as your RO gets bigger, so do those canisters. So the other means of reducing that is by adding a reducing agent into your system. In this case, the most common is a metabisulfite injection. Um, metabisulfite is good, and that's a chemical injection, which allows you to knock down and reduce the chlorine levels. It does have some of its own downsides, however. One, metabisulfite is fairly unstable. So it can only really be kept for a short amount of time. So if you have a reagent vessel or some storage chemical of metabisulfite, it has a shelf life of only about 15 to 20 days. So there is maintenance involved with doing that. Whereas carbon beds can go a long time before they need to be regenerated and or replaced. Um, and what very often happens in a system is you might have what's called chlorine breakthrough or carbon breakthrough in a system. And we don't even really notice this in day to day uh, but very often, you know, our city water is flush with a high volume of hypochlorite at a certain point um, to basically help purify the system. And when that actually gets to your RODI system, it can actually cause following of your RO membranes or more stream following um, as you have an increased level that's not that's basically atypical in your system. So it's just kind of something to sort of bear in mind at that point um, that. There are other means to do that. The same thing goes for water softeners. You can do anti-scale injection. And then people ask, well, what happens to these chemicals downstream? They get flushed out with the RO. They become part of the RO reject stream at that point. Um, the residual from the chemical reaction goes out as part of the RO reject. Uh, at this point, uh, we have our first poll question that go up. 
And if everyone wants to take a few minutes to kind of go through that, uh, we'll take about 30 seconds and then we'll kind of go through the answers. All right, so the, uh, the poll was the water generation rate of a high purity water system is um, A, the loop distribution rate, B, the reverse osmosis or pretreatment generation rate, the final C, the final filter throughput, or D, the number of mixed bed canisters. The answer is B, in this case, uh, the reverse osmosis and pretreatment generation rate. Again, you're generating water in this case. And that's one of the major parameters. That's also one of the things that really comes up quite a bit in design. And it kind of segues into this, which I'm showing you here. And what we're looking at here on this side is what we refer to as an RO projection. So this is really kind of the engineering that goes into um, how you really design an RO system. And what you're looking at in this kind of thing, you know, based on different uh, membrane technologies and really all the different membrane manufacturers, they have a certain programs that you can use to effectively model um, how your RO is going to function in a given situation. And this is what, you know, we would do, you know, as far as looking at what your city water quality parameters are. So you can see here on the, on the right, there's a number of different parameters. Um, you know, between sodium, you know, barium, strontium, carbonates, you know, fullerenes, coins, et cetera. And this is kind of your initial sort of feed water. And then you can kind of look at what the different stages are. And at the end, you can see we go from, you know, a TDS level, you know, you know, feed of 125 down to 1.11. And there's a number of different variable parameters that come up in this. And these are kind of our design parameters. You have 75 GPM in. Um, you have a feed pressure that can be varied. You can change your array function, which I'll show you guys here in a second. You can feed the temperature. You can change the temperature of the water coming in. And you know our ultimate permeate goal is really goes about for up about 45 GPM. So the reason I say the feed flow and the raw flow are different is um, the raw flow is actually the amount of water I'm putting into the RO. The feed flow is a combination of a portion of the reject stream as well as the raw water feed, so that's 75 GPM. So I'm bringing 15 GPM back of my actual reject to go back through my system each time, with the end target being 45 GPM, which in this case would be a 75% recovery target. And, you know, this is kind of how, so as you do your pretreatment, you kind of vary out all these different ions, you know, if you knock down, you get too much hardness, you get solubility, you could get, you could get, you get precipitation, you can lower this number. Temperature comes into play. The lower the temperature of the water is actually better for an RO membrane because it actually allows them to constrict, which then actually, like any, you know, any filter, if it has you more, if its pores are more constricted, it actually gets, it actually gets you a better filtration product or permeates, but you need to put a higher pressure into the system. So if you're looking at catalog cuts of ROs and say, hey, it's 70, get 70 degrees, I get X throughputs, that's under that's that's effectively undersizing your RO. Because what they're saying there is by increasing the temperature, I'm opening the porosity of my RO up. And I'm going to get a lower quality water, you know, i.e. down here, but I'm going to get a, but I'm going to get more throughput through it. And this is kind of what it looks like sort of from a PNID standpoint. You can see you have your feed pump and this is your two by one by one array. Um, so basically the reject, so the feed goes into the first stage, then the reject goes to the second, to the third, and each one of these combines then to form your overall permeate in those cases. This is kind of a very similar example here. So it shows like upstream heat exchanging, or again, you're actually lowering the temperature uh, in those cases for usage. And this is why it's really important to have an understanding of what your feed water quality is, particularly on bigger systems. Um, because the more you understand the feed water quality, this allows you to better optimize your pretreatment. And looking back, all of these different parameters here, um, this is what's ultimately, this is your, these, these are, this is your TDS. This is what's ultimately going to affect your end water product quality in those cases. Anything that, so the reason, so, this is kind of the second part of the equation. I said, you know, while people refer to systems as kind of RODI systems, when we're talking about high purity water systems. And because these really two do go in concert, when you're talking about after the RO, you have some kind of deionization. And DI is a very different process than RO, which we just talked about. RO is a mechanical filter, it's under pressure, it's putting a certain permeate water through. When you're talking about DI, what you're talking about now is a chemical exchange process. 
whereby I'm taking these various ions and cations and I'm having them exchanged with sites on a resin on a resin bead, which then generates water as a byproduct. So every cation form, pulls a proton, every anion forms a hydroxyl, and the two combine to essentially form water. DI is really what moves your resistivity up from, you know, half a mega ohm, a quarter mega ohm water off of an RO, up to 10, 15, and then up to say 18 mega ohm water. Um, and it's really doing what's ultimately referred to as kind of the polishing of your system. The thing with resin is resin, unlike an RO, it's an exhaustible thing. So as the water goes through, the, it's going through a chemical exchange process. You have a fixed amount of actual locations in your DI system, you know, in your DI bottle that allows you to do um, this form of exchange. So if you, so what it means, if you skip putting an RO into your system and you go straight into a DI, the DI will take out a lot of the different things that actually are used, a lot of the different, um, a lot of the different contaminants, which you, which, you know, which your RO will, but it's going to, but it's going to exhaust your DI at a very rapid rate. Um, that rapid rate could be a matter of a couple of days, or it could be met off several hours, depending upon what your water quality is. So you know, something like hardness chlorines they'll all fall out in a resin bottle as well as they would in a softener but they're not but this is not a targeted and it's not like a filter which can run you know for long periods of time this could be exhausted very quickly that being said di in tandem with ro is a really is you know is really how you kind of push that main water parameter people think about which is conductivity as well as resistivity and here's here's a, here's some of the different ions which are found between you know cations and anions. These are some of the most common ones: sodium, potassium, carbonates, sulfates, bicarbonates. All these are which, which are which are very commonly found uh, in water. And DI is a size-based thing, so it's really based on it's really based on flow through your system. And you know, based on the amount of square footage, you can generally put with standard mixed bed high purity resin about three, two to three GPM through one cubic feet. So a very standard resin bottle size is three and a half cubic feet or 14 by 47. And that's about 10 GPM roughly. Um, so that's kind of, now BDI is done in kind of a more manageable fashion in those cases so that it can be more easily exchanged. And you monitor the DI by having resistivity measured both before and after the bottle. And as you see, obviously, you know, those numbers becoming closer together, the differential between them come closer together, your resin is beginning to exhaust. Um, because of how DI is, is, is set up, though, you end up with a very large amount of bottles. So if I have 100 gallons per minute, for example, now I have 10 to 12 bottles in series. And this becomes quite a thing as far as cost of resin, maintenance of exchanging individual bottles as, you know, as, they, you know, as they exhaust, as well as footprint. Um, so it's often not necessarily required to put the DI actually in the distribution side of your system. A lot of times DI is also placed in the pretreatment side right after your RO. So if you have a water quantity like an ASTM2 or ASTM3, where you're looking at like a one mega ohm or four mega ohm water, it doesn't have to constantly be polished through the loop. You could have your pretreatment, you're gonna have your RO directly feed your DI and then have a slipstream off of your primary loop come back and then run through your DI, um, you know, basically polishing a fraction of that water in those cases. And kind of on the kind of in tandem with DI is also what's referred to as, as electro-deionization. And electro-deionization does a very similar function to DI, but does it in a very different manner. And electro-deionization works is you're using electrical current as a means to then draw those ions out of solution. So you have an anode and you have a cathode, positive and negatively charged, and under fairly high voltage, you're able to then pull um, your ions out of the solution and you out of the water stream, and you end up with a very, very small reject stream, which then passes that water down to drain. Unlike an RO, where that reject stream can be 20, 25, 30, 40% of your water, this is like two to 5% of your water comes out as an EDI. 
EDIs are nice in that you don't have any chemicals, you don't have to regenerate them, and they're real and they're much smaller in size comparative to you know a series of DI bottles. Their downside is they take a lot of power. You know, even a five or seven GPM EDI could need its own dedicated 30 amp, 460 volt power feed. So there is a lot of current required uh, to use these. Um, so they can be definitely used in tandem. These are almost always found right after the RO. And coming out of an EDI, which is sized properly, you could get about 15 to 16 mega ohm water coming out of your system. In ultra pure water design, we're looking at like semiconductor grade water, EDI and DI are used in tandem uh, to achieve that very high level water quality in those cases. Mark, so I have another question for you here. So we know that temperature can impact intermolecular activity and how quickly molecules bounce around. So what is the impact on water temperature specifically on RO system design in terms of EDI and other factors? Sure. So that's kind of a, there's a lot kind of going on in that question. As I mentioned during the RO discussion, Smaller temperature swings, say between 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, affects the permeate, basically affects the permeability of your RO membrane. So at a lower temperature, you have less permeation and a higher water quality. At higher temperatures, like 70 degrees, you end up with um, you know, more throughput. That being said, this equipment, high, high temperature water is actually an issue in these systems. Um, most RO membranes are only designed to operate about 100 degrees and less. So if for some reason you do have hot water in your system, that can actually cause degradation of your membranes very quickly. That's typically not an issue very often unless you're in the pharmaceutical industry. In the pharma industry, people do do hot water sanitization. Um, and that can be done either from the storage tank down or that can be done throughout the entire system. And in those cases, there are more specialty designed pretreatment apparatuses, you know, water softeners, carbon beds, there's steel, there's stainless steel, as well as ROs and membranes, which are designed to operate at a hot water sanitizable rate. Um, so there is that option there to do that as well. Um, on a DI side, the higher the temperature, the actual, the more reactivity you get. Um, but again, most of these are not really designed to operate at high temperatures. Kind of that being said, temperature is kind of a detriment in a lot of this. You know, a lot of times in addition to the ASTM water qualities or cap water qualities that you have, one of the things you want to maintain in your system is a certain temperature for your distribution. And during, so a lot of people actually, so a lot of systems are designed to have temperature control, you know, as part of their distribution loop. And a lot of the temperature comes from the comes from a period of lack of use in your system. So if you have a loop and you have distribution loop, you have your pumps and you have ultraviolet lights, for example, which we're talking about here in your system, they can put a lot of energy in and running through the building, you know, to the various labs or clean rooms or process equipment and what have you, you can get higher temperature rises running through your actual system. And that can lead, you know, so that a lot of times they will have temperature purges or even heat exchangers as part of a loop design to kind of help maintain keeping that water at, you know, 70 degrees or 60 degrees, you know, it's kind of standard city water temperature that you would typically want to see. And once you have a specific process where they're actually using it, you know, as more of a chilled water source in those cases. RO units um, in general are designed to take out bacteria, pyrogens, and things that cause fever in the human body, viruses. But any any water-based system that has a lot, you know, that has these resin vessels and recirculation, you know, will over time build up some level of bacteria in them. And UV lights are the primary means during the polishing portion of your system to destroy that bacteria. Um, 
as well as to remove other things such as told such, such as TOC. And they come in two primary wavelengths um, UV lights, 254 nanometer and 185 nanometer. 254 nanometer exists in the UVC range and is designed to essentially sterilize bacteria. It doesn't actually remove bacteria from your system, it sterilizes it so that it can't so that you can't precipitate more additional growth in your system. It's also utilized as a means to break down ozone, which is, util which is used as part of the sanitization process, whether that's an onboard sanitization process or a, um, you know, a or basically, you know, as a maintenance-based sanitization process. 185 nanometer UV is designed for TOC reduction. And TOC is something that is actually generated as part of a resin bed. So while you do remove it with your RO, you do get some small portion of it off uh, from your actual deionization process. And 185 nanometer, which is exists in the UV vacuum, so it's a much shorter wavelength, is designed to break down those carbon chains. You can get away with using one UV as opposed to two of them, depending on what your end water quality parameters are. 185 nanometer UVs are designed, do you have a small 254 nanometer peak? So if you oversize a 185 nanometer UV, you can use a single UV unit uh, as part of your system if you don't have very high bacteria requirements. Neither one of these takes the place of having sanitization as part of a routine system, though, to help alleviate bacteria in your system. And then finally, kind of going with that, that list we talked about earlier, you know, the last item is really the final filters. And the final filters, I know it seems a little bit odd that you've gone through an RO and DI and all these multimedia, but the final filters are really designed to catch endotoxins and other small semi, there's much smaller bacteria, there's much smaller particles which have accumulated in your system. And typically 0 0.5 to 0 0.03 is the standard. Uh, again, depending upon what particle specs you're looking at um, as, you know, in your water quality. These can be relatively simple. Stainless steel to sanitary or tea style filters um, for more specific, you know, for, for pharmaceutical grade systems to even having like UF or ultra filter based um, filters if you're talking about semi semiconductor grade particle counts. In between your, your distribution system as well as your um, generation system, you have some kind of a storage tank. And the storage tank really acts as kind of that break point where I have my makeup rate going into my system um, from my RO, my pretreatments. And this serves kind of also as the kind of the start and the stop of any kind of a high pretty water loop. Um, and its its sizing is, I'm gonna say it's arbitrary, but it's 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 based on a number of different factors, essentially. And by and large, you don't necessarily want to store a large volume of high purity water. Um, the more water you store, the longer, obviously, depending on the water quality parameters you're trying to target, you know, you will get some degradation over time just by having it stored. Now, this water is constantly in motion, it's constantly being pumped down. Um, you have a loop, you have you have um, you have um, filters on the tank to prevent any particles from being drawn in during the pump and fill cycles of a, of the, you know, of the storage tank. Um, you may have a spray ball in there to help kind of keep the water, you know, moving through all parts of the surface area. And you can even have nitrogen blanketing at higher, you know, at higher water qualities where you're effectively keeping the atmosphere out of these tanks. And you know, typically their size, you know, kind of based on the flow rates in your loop, their size a little bit based on how much storage you have. And typically, you know, you want to, the pretreatment side of your system works best when it runs more continuously. So this kind of thing, you almost want to have a storage volume where your RO and your pretreatment are running 80% of the time effectively, sort of constantly sort of drip, you know, low, you know, the lower flow going into this tank. And then you have an adequate volume in there to help sustain the flow through your processes as well as your actual loop um, volume as well as velocities. And kind of a side note, one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is, you know, a lot of more environmental and water conservation efforts are made 
RO systems, you know, where they do generate a high purity of water, they do have a lot of different waste streams that come off of them, particularly RO reject. And there is being more and more concentrated efforts throughout the country in certain areas, especially to help try to reclaim or reuse some of that RO uh, rejected water. In the end, it's really a little more than concentrated city water. So there is a bit of a push to um, reclaim that for other purposes, you know, whether that's trap priming or irrigation or what have you. And again, very simplistic kind of systems can be tied into these to allow you to do that. Essentially nothing more than a storage tank and then basically pressurization as an option. Hey Mark, I had another question for you before you move on. Um, what is the purpose of nitrogen blanketing on the storage tank itself? Of course. So the nitrogen blanketing on a, on a high purity water storage tank is essentially designed to keep the atmosphere from interacting with the water. Nitrogen itself is inert and does not have a very high solubility with water. And when the water is made to the purity levels, you know, in, in, in very higher end systems, particularly true of ultra pure water systems, the very atmosphere, the carbon, you know, carbon dioxide, which is actually in our atmosphere, will redissolve into your water. And that'll actually lower your water quality. So nitrogen blanket is essentially designed to protect the water in your storage tank, uh, which is open to the atmosphere through obviously a, like a vented filter to keep, you know, 0 0.2 micron hydrophobic filter, but itself to basically keep any dissolved gases then from reaffecting your water quality parameters. The instrumentation of these systems is extremely variable and, you know, at a minimum, obviously resistivity or conductivity measurements, you know, play a very big part in it um, between monitoring the percent reject across an RO uh, to feeding, you know, to monitoring the you know, loop as well as the DI or EDI systems, flow and pressure for pump control and prevention of water hammering up to, you know, more elaborate monitoring to actually look at the different water qualities which are found, you know, which, which water qualities you're trying to target, TOC monitoring, hardness monitoring, um, you know, there's different boron monitoring. There's one I put on a system a couple of years back in some inductor industry. You know, particle counters can be utilized. There's a lot, and that really depends on how critical that water quality is or having a validated or proven or, you know, provable system to your process is, um, you know, most of these can either be, most of these almost always can be done in the sanitary configuration in NIST. The other one that should put on here is a lot of the monitoring around the UV light, for example, whether that's intensity monitoring or over temperature monitoring. Um, so there is a lot of ways to measure, although not all of it can be done in real time. So for any high purity water system, there is still the need over time to do some level of high purity sampling uh, to ensure that you are getting that. And that is a, that is a bit of a science onto itself because as I just mentioned uh, with that question, opening that water up to the air, you know, can definitely affect its water quality. So there is certainly a need, you know, to have when you do sampling, actually have somebody who does that in the realm of high purity water as well. Before we go on to the next part, that we are, we're, it's time for our next poll question. Um, again, these are optional. If you guys have any interest in them, and we'll talk about them here in a couple of minutes, in a couple seconds. Sorry. All right. So the, the poll question was: a 254 nanometer is used for TOC destruct, true or false? The answer to that is false. Um, 254 nanometer does not have the proper wavelength to, to, to do TOC reduction. And there really is only two primary means of reducing TOC in your system, and that is going to be your RO as well as your TOC, which will actually which will remove some of the TOC as well as your TOC 185 nanometer and 185 nanometer UV light, which operates in the UVC vacuum range to allow you to remove TOC. One of the other parts of, a, of any high purity water system, which often does not get discussed in too much detail, which is still a part of it, is the loop. And this is kind of where you come off of your system, you've gone through all your different you know, all your different technologies, and 
you have a, and you feed this to your loop, which is going to then go to your, all your various processes, lab syncs, you know, tools throughout your facility. And the loop itself, there's a lot of different technologies, but it also has to still maintain that same high purity as the balance of your system. And there are a number of different types of loop materials available from polypropylene, the pigmented, you know, the you know, SDR11s to Kynar, PVDF, which is, a, which is one of the few plenum rated materials to sanitary thermoplastic polypropylene and PVDF to sanitary stainless steel. Um, and this, the selection of those really depends very widely on how much, you know, on really what your water quality is and what your building code or where you're going to be running your loop in the actual system. Um, if you're talking about semiconductor grades, you're probably in the PVDF range. If you're talking about lab, you might be polypropylene. Um, pharmaceuticals are going to be sanitary. Obviously, the sanitary is designed for the bacteria requirements, either thermoplastic or stainless steel. If you're going to do something like steam sanitizable throughout your loop. And one of the primary things to do with your loop is obviously to minimize any dead legs in there. Um, and loops come in a couple of different styles. I like to refer to them as the serpentine loop or as what's referred to as like the ladder loop. And a serpentine loop is probably what most people think of. And that's when you have a single loop, um, which is generated off of your system. It kind of runs around your entire building as one loop and then comes back to your storage tank, um, you know, essentially pressure or like, you know, pressure, essentially pressure regulated at the actual storage tank. Um, the other style of loops is what we refer to as a ladder loop. And this is kind of what you see here, where I have a main feed and a main return loop. And off of each one of these loops, I then have a sub loop, whether that's a level of a floor or a lab. And that allows me to essentially control the flow and pressure at individual loops, individual kind of sub loops off of a main then regulated header um, in a return that comes back, um, back, back and forth from my system. This is by far and away the more common on bigger applications where you have much bigger loops. Um, we are going to go through that and you're going to have, you know, basically sub loops where I might have like a three inch feed and I have like a one or one and a half inch uh, sub loop at each of the individual levels. And then serpentine loops are more common in smaller loop applications where I'm going to have a loop and I'm going to, um, you know, want it maybe like just around a couple of different processes or a couple of different tools, uh, you know, in those cases. And on a ladder loop, what you do is you essentially have a regulator, as you can see here, at each individual floor. So a serpentine loop, you have a lot of pressure off and you're kind of holding pressure throughout the whole loop. You know, here, as you do a ladder loop, you can have a feed pressure and then you're going to have sub pressures, maybe at 25 PSI or 30 PSI, you know, at each individual floor or area you're going into so they can operate, um, you, know, more, you know, more appropriately for use in those cases. And I'm not going to delve super deep into this today, um, but kind of going through a loop design really involves looking at kind of two things. One, obviously, is going to be the friction loss of the various material that you have going through your loop. That's based on all the different materials and kind of look at here between schedule 80 PVC, you have different losses at different flow rates. And then between 304, 316 stainless steel, polypropylene, and then, you know, even like sanitary PVDF in those cases, they all have different levels um, at different flow rates. And the really important thing is people used to talk about velocity through a loop. And it's partially true that you want to maintain some level of velocity in a high purity water loop, but there isn't a set thing saying, hey, I want to maintain three to five feet per second or six feet per second. What's important is really to maintain turbulent flow. So it's really about looking at your Reynolds number to see that you actually have turbulent flow in your loop. And equally as important to make sure, make sure that you have sufficient volume in your loop. Um, so in doing it, so looking at a calculation and saying, okay, I need say 30 GPM at, at, you know, at like worst case throughout my loop at any given point, I'm going to size my flow at say 50 GPM. So that I always have that 20 or 30 GPM to maintain sufficient volume, pressure, and sufficient velocity through my loop. Um, so that's why a lot of people will sometimes say, hey, you know, I only need, you know, whatever this one machine or one tool only pulls 5 GPM, make your loop like 10 or 15 so that you constantly have sufficient velocity in those loops. And there's 
there's a kind of a science kind of a whole sort of separate a little bit a little bit outside of the realm of what we're talking about today but it gives you an idea of kind of what you need to maintain in order to properly and adequately size a loop in those cases and this just kind of looks at the different q values obviously um, and this presentation will be available be recording of this you guys can look through this in a little more detail um, and kind of look at you know how this is really done some of these calculations in here We're going to wrap up our last poll question here. I know we're getting a little bit close to uh, to the time here. Uh, we'll post that here uh, just real quick. All right, and the poll question is: All the following materials are used in loop design, except um, polypropylene, PVDF, three sixteen stainless steel, or PVC. Obviously, the answer, you know, or, or carbon steel. Obviously, carbon steel is not used. Any piping material. Uh, which would be affected by DI water or could then contaminate DI water is not utilized in, 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 a, in a high purity water loop. Um, and even PVC by and large is not utilized very often in these systems. Um, PVC, there is a brand of high purity PVC. It's not that common anymore. Uh, that's like a clear PVC. A lot of it has to do with the chlorine, the glues that are utilized, which actually will then leach into the water as you use them. So by and large, a weld system such as a polypropylene or stainless steel orbital weld and passivated systems, which you most commonly see with these systems. Just kind of putting this all together, going through a couple of PNIDs here at the end. This is just kind of a really kind of a we'll walk through a really quick kind of case study here, kind of showing some of the things we just talked about. And this is a semiconductor fab application. And this is the water quality we're targeting. Um, you can see here you have 18 mega ohm water, you have resist Oops. 18 mega ohm water, TOC of 5, online oxygen levels of 25, some of the different particle counts that are used in this. This is kind of your target water quality. It's not quite an ASTM E1, but it's very similar to it. And this again, kind of going through, this is the actual same RO protection we talked about previously. You can see, you know, how this is really designed. I kind of went through and showed this earlier, you know, by basically plugging in from their water quality, all the different parameters here um, to get that kind of optimized, you know, total dissolved solids level. And when you go more into an RO projection, you're going to see that there's actually things about, you know, different elemental recoveries, there's different saturation limits that can be reached. Um, but what I really want to try to show you here is sort of a P&ID of one of these systems. So this really here is what we refer to as the generation portion. As I said, generation portion of an RO loop um, can really kind of show you, it really kind of starts really with, you know, the filtration, water softening, chlorine removal. In this case, we have a city water break tank upstream of it um, that gets efficient pressure through the multimedia. Um, and then we go into, oops, this is not showing right. Uh, through our, this is, I do apologize, there's a slight error. I will have a corrected version of this slide posted for you guys. This is actually repeating the PNID here, so I'm just going to admit that error to you guys. But there's this 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 uh, drawing is supposed to actually be showing you guys the rest of the pre-treatment, but it's, for some reason they're showing the RO twice. Um, so I apologize. Downstream of these multimedia filters, there is um, metabisulfite injection, RO cleaning, as well as water softening in those cases. Um, and then we go into the actual RO system here where I have my heat exchanger and I go through my different um, ROs. Um, again, this is repeated here. This is a small error in the presentation, which we'll, we'll send out an, an amendum so you guys can see that. We then go into our storage tank. Um, in this case, we have a distribution out to an RO feed. Um, and then, so the RO feed goes out and then we go through an EDI system. As you can see here, that's your percent reject where you're monitoring the effectiveness. Um, then you have your small reject stream here. And then you have your distribution. This is your storage tank. Um, this actually has a spray ball. This is your this is your um, pressure. This is your regulating valves coming back here. Uh, this is your vent with your final filters. You do have nitrogen blanketing in this case. That's your nitrogen blanketing feed built-in ozonization. 
Um, and then you have your storage tank, which goes, you have your distribution pumps, which goes out through your UV, um, through your mixed beds, and then through your series of final filters in this case. So this is kind of sort of putting it all together, you know, how this would kind of lay out in a system. As I mentioned before, systems, they can get fairly big. So this is really your entire high purity water system here. We have city water break tank through all of your pretreatment, through your ROs. We need to have room here to actually pull the membranes out for access. The DI banks, again, done very often, they're done redundantly. So you don't have to shut down the water feed through your system as you, as you exchange out the bottles. Um, this is your RO distribution, and then this is your DI distribution in those cases. When you're talking about life sciences, I'm going to kind of end off on the life sciences here a little bit. There's a few things that, that come into play which are a little bit different than what we just talked about. Um, and they say they're looking at two different parameters here. They're looking at the USP or US pharmacopoeia, and they're looking at WFI, which is water for injection. Water for injection, um, Liffy, is made with a little bit different technologies than what we're talking about today. Those are done with things like sanitary stills. Um, and, you know, they really place in place of like an RO or a membrane-based, by and large, they're ARM, RO, membrane-based um, systems that do do that. They're a little bit more specialized. USP water can be done either way. It can be done via RO membrane or it can be done uh, via sanitary still. And the main thing to notice is when talking about pharmaceutical grade water like this, not all pharma utilizes USP or WFI. Pharmaceutical has a number of labs where they use ASTM waters as well. But from a production standpoint, they tend to use USP or EP. And what you can see here is they don't really look at resistivity that much. You're talking more about conductivity, um, endotoxins. You're talking about bacteria levels being significantly lower. Really, they're more focused less on sort of the EDI and the DI. If they even have those components, you're talking more about sanitary, you're talking about bacteria, you're talking about sanitization in these types of systems more than anything else. So a little bit of a different design, how they, how they put together. And, you know, you know, they have sanitization, steam, hot water, or chemical, they're validated. They're, 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 you know, all the instruments are validated, all the welds are mapped and boroscope. This is what sanitary stainless piping look like. You can still use thermoplastics in these. Um, obviously, not so much in the piping, although there is, as I mentioned before, sanitary thermoplastic piping, which is also utilized in these types of systems. This is just one example. This is actually a lab base, but you have um, a stainless steel tank in this case. This is actually a distribution off of an existing loop. Um, we're doing a little bit of DI treatment here. You can see the picture of this guy right here um, as a 3D model. Um, when you're talking about these types of systems, you know, this is kind of more what you're seeing. You're seeing more the process kettle-based design. Um, these are going to be jacketed. The jacketing is for sanitization when they're doing steam or hot water in those cases. And it's just a little bit of a different niche in this type of system. So it's worth kind of just wanting to bring it up here at the end, worth noting that there are some differences between, say, semi and lab greater ASTM-1, and then looking at these. Now, looking at them in like a sanitary still, that's kind of a whole sort of separate technology at that point. Um, that's the end of our webinar here. Um, our next one will be on May 17th at one o'clock and it will be on pump transfer stations and pH systems. Um, the sign up for that is open. If anybody is interested, you can sign up now. There'll be reminders as well. And with that, are there any more questions, Madison? Not for me. Uh, let's check out our chat and see if we have some questions. I'm not seeing any questions coming through now, but I can follow up with you um, with a couple. Uh, another one that I have is how do you determine and how often do you need to exchange or regenerate DI beds? Sure. 
Um, and again, just before I answer that, if anybody has any questions, this is my contact, my email, and it'll also be an email blast going out. Um, anybody can feel free to email us any questions after the fact, and we will send out a recording of this as well for those who are interested in it. Um, now to answer your question, so the DI beds are, are always monitored, and they can be monitored by either a resistivity cell, or they can be monitored by a resistivity sensor, uh, both before and after. And when you begin to see that differential begin to get too close, you do know um, you do know that the resin has become exhausted at that point. And the same thing is also true for the RO as well. Um, RO systems are monitored what's called percent reject, and that's also a before and after resistivity measurement. And if you see any less than a 93% um, increase, you know the RO memory is beginning to follow at that point and needs to be cleaned or replaced. Okay, thank you. I do have a couple others from the question box coming in here um, from Ken Holliday asking how nitrogen and ozone uh, destruction are managed. Sure. Um, nitrogen isn't such, nitrogen isn't really destructed in the system. Um, nitrogen is used in blanketing, uh, is often put on just the top level of the water. Um, as a means to prevent, you know, the atmosphere. If you have nitrogen, nitrogen is a target in your water quality, you need to go to degassing membranes. Um, and a degassing membrane can target nitrogen or can target oxygen or other dissolved gases. Nitrogen is often also used as a medium in those types of systems because it doesn't have a very high solubility. Um, so a degassing membrane operates a little bit differently by use of a vacuum pump and passing the liquid through that and is often used in semiconductor applications or other ones where you do have a degas uh, requirement. Ozone destruct uh, is typically done through the UV lights. So if you're doing ozone destruct as part of the sanitization process, you deactivate the UV lights and you disconnect them. You basically bypass around the final filters or you remove them during the sanitization process and you bubble it into the tank, it's allowed to recirculate, say, overnight. You turn the UV lights back on, oh, as well as the mix beds. You bypass the mix beds in that case as well if they're in your loop. Um, it's not destroy your mix beds pretty quickly. Um, you then turn the 234 nanometer UV light back on, and that will break down the ozone into oxygen, which then just harmlessly off gases in your storage tank. Um, and then you do ozone, they do an ozone testing uh, at different points in your facility when the ozone's purged. You know it. Oh, Mark, I think we lost you there for a second. Oh. And you're back. Did anybody, did anybody catch that? Uh, it was just like a, a couple second blip there. Sure. Um, another, oh, Ken was asking how you keep the nitrogen blanket while also destructing the ozone, I think. Uh, um, so there, so, so when you're doing the ozonation process, you are not typically using the nitrogen blanket in those cases. If you have onboard ozonization they really don't mix per se because the ozone itself will be dissolved in through the actual storage tank when you're basically doing when you're basically pump when you're basically pulling the pumps down so there is some residual and we're not talking about very high levels of ozone we're talking about a couple we're talking about you know very small quantities which are injected into there um they'll just harmlessly interact with the nitrogen at that point um when they're actually utilized Okay. Um, Zach Lee asks, what procedures can be used to prevent or mitigate RO membrane fouling? The best way to prevent RO membrane fouling is to properly pre-treat your water. Um, and, you know, one of the primary fouls of, 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 an, of an RO membrane is going to be hardness or other precipitation. And how that happens is obviously when you're running the, the water through your membrane, you're concentrating it. You all of a sudden now go from a system which would not precipitate under normal situations to a much more concentrated stream, which can then precipitate out in your membrane. And that's one of the ways that RO membranes are fouled. 
Um, over time, bacteria also does build up in them and it can see degradation from things like temperature. Um, there are RO cleaning solutions, which are largely just anti-scalants, um, which can be pumped into an RO during operation to allow them to operate without following uh, for a more period of time. The average length, the average lifespan of an RO membrane is about three to five years uh, before they need to be changed generally anyways. Um, but obviously they can follow much quicker than that and having proper pretreatment and then using anti-scale and cleaning chemicals is the way to prevent them from following or maintain them as long as you can. Okay. Um, another question we have from Chris May is that they are looking for an RODI system that needs a variable flow rate of water. And they noted that most of those systems they see prefer a constant flow rate. Is this a common problem? And are there solutions that you recommend? Um, can you repeat that one, Madison? Yeah. Um, Chris May is looking into an RODI system that needs a variable flow rate for water. And they're seeing that most RODI systems prefer a constant flow rate for inlet and treatment. So is this a common problem and are there solutions that you recommend when you have a variable influent? If you have a variable influent, I would bring it to a brake tank and I'd pressurize it through your system at a constant feed rate. I would do it to city water brake tank at that point, which may not be city water feed, it could be another, another source, but I'd bring it to a tank uh, and that way you have consistent flow and pressure uh, to feed your or to feed your pretreatment in your um, high purity water system. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, um, another question: Is PVDF always considered sanitary, or is there dedicated sanitary PVDF? There is dedicated sanitary PVDF. Not all PVDF is sanitary. However, all PVDF is plenum rated. Okay. Um, from Ken, would you be able to design an ROGI system to treat, treat wastewater from a plating operation if you're trying to get one mega ohm water quality? So if you're bringing, that's, that, there are systems which are designed to treat what's especially called a reclaim water at that point. And while it is possible, it would require to look at the water quality coming off. I'm assuming in this case, it's, it's a plate tank, it'd be a rinse tank, uh, where you'd have a certain level of probably um, some chemical residue and or, you know, depending on what is in there, grease, you know, oil or, um, uh, you know, if it's, you know, acid bath or something like that, it's possible. It, it just requires you to look at the water quality and then actually look at what you would need uh, as far as an RO projection. Um, all ROs really need to look at, and there are a lot of different RO membranes out there. There are those which are designed for brackish, those designed for, um, you know, Jordan's geared towards different levels of water. And it may have to look at it may have to look at using more of a specialized membrane in those cases. Um, and regardless of that, you have to get the water to a level that's referred to as an SDI value, so salt density index between of less than five. Um, so it may just require some additional pretreatment at that point. So it's doable. It's it that's that's it would it would need, need I would need to look at what the actual process parameters are to give a more accurate answer. Okay. Um, Colin asks, where's the best place to insert a gas stripping column into an RO system? If you were going to do, if you were going to do degas, most degas is going to have to be done on the distribution side to maintain it at the right, depending on the water, whatever the target water quality is, it generally has to go on the distribution side of the system. Okay. Um, Zach has another question for chilled RO water at about two to five GPM. Do you chill the water first and then treat it through the RO or you treat it through the RO first and then chill the water? 
Um, I would say if you have if you have water at say like 40, 50 degrees, that, that can go through the RO. You have to just size the RO to have sufficient pressure to allow it to operate properly. If you need to maintain that at your point of use, you may need to subsequently maintain that chilled water um, as part of your loop design. But you don't have, but there's no issue with putting it quote unquote chilled within reason. You know, once you're below 40, that becomes much more. You would have to raise the temperature if you're going to be below 40 degrees going into your RO. Okay. Um, Ken has another question. What is an acceptable ORP um, microvolt value to ensure that the SMBS has reduced the free available chlorine in an RO feed stream? So you probably wouldn't even look at an ORP reading for something like that. You'd be looking at something less than a couple ppm effectively. So if you have chlorine level that high, you would need to do more chlorine treatment at that point. I can I can um I can look up what value you might want to use. I don't know off the top of my head what would be a good target for the ORP, but typically you're looking more at a ppm value than you're looking at an ORP reading for that. Okay. All right, that seems to be um, all the questions that we have at this point. Okay, and like I said, anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to email us. We will make the presentation available um, and there will be a packet coming out for any feedback. And thank you everyone for joining us.